Um, as we can see, uh, we've titled this World in Play, which is a rather modest um, you know, ambition to get through in an hour. Um, I want to just quickly introduce the session. Um, we, a few years ago, we launched a service called Middle East in Play, and, and that was in our Energy Compass publication. And the idea was basically that the changes that were happening in the Arab Spring and in the Middle East sort of went beyond the sort of change of regimes, and it sort of pointed to more fundamental changes happening in the region. And we were uh, aware that the uh, changes that were going to happen, you know, w w definitely would take some time to play out. And we had uh, these borders that have been in place in the Middle East for 100 years, and the question was, how durable are these borders? Uh, how is it all going to play out? And when you remove the top-down sort of rule that we had over so many years, what was going to be left? So the Middle East in play was saying, the Middle East is now in play. There are, uh, for people inside and outside the region, there are opportunities to take advantage of this, depending on how they play their cards. So that, that was the original thing that we started with. And then when we got to the, when we got to the uh, 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 formation of Islamic State, we, we, had a, we finally had some indications of what we were really talking about. And this is an entity that didn't have borders. Um, it wasn't recognized by anyone, but it existed, and it sort of baffled a lot of people. And you know, it, it pointed to those fundamental changes that we're trying to identify. And you know, the thinking was that uh, you know, this entity now controlled oil. Uh, it actually was winning battles. And uh, we're trying to understand exactly you know, what this entity was. But you know, this is kind of the long uh, narrative of what happened in the Arab Spring back in 2010 and 2011. So you know, significantly, this entity now uh, only controls you know, maybe less than 10,000 barrels a day, although it used to control probably up to 50,000. But it does border states that, that pump up to 20 million barrels a day, which is more than 20% of the world's uh, oil output. So you know, by luck or by chance or whatever, oil has kept flowing, but we can't assume it's always going to be that way. And then we had the Ukraine crisis. And, and, and this sort of, again, like Islamic State, could be viewed in sort of an isolation, like a, a one-off thing. But it did point to sort of these more fundamental questions in Europe, because Europe thought it figured out its borders after World War II or after the Cold War. But what happened in Crimea is uh, Russia showed that actually those borders may not be as uh, set as people thought they were. So um, Ukraine, again, viewed in the context of this, basically says, look, the, the borders of the Europe are not as set as uh, perhaps people thought they were. And this sort of lays the foundation for what we're talking about of a world in play, where anything is possible, uh, not that anything is going to happen. But we have to be aware that these geopolitical changes, based on assumptions that were made 20 years ago, 100 years ago, may have to be questioned. So that's the foundation for our sort of rather ambitious uh, session called uh, World in Play. And we have a very distinguished panel here who will um, touch on all these issues, and I'll introduce them. We have Ghassan Salome, uh, Dean, Paris School of International Affairs from Sciences Po, Fedor Lukyanov, Chairman, Council on Foreign and Defense Policy in Moscow, Alistair Crook, Director and Founder of Complex Forum, and Bijan Kazapur, Managing and Founding Partner of Atia International. So I, I, think, I think the right format for this session is we're going to jump right into questions. And I'm going to sort of go ask Gassan to, to kick us off here um, and start with the co sort of core issue of Islamic State. Uh, why does this entity still exist? Is it because of incompetence of its foes? Is it because of its strength? Is it because of its ideology? Why do we still have an Islamic State a year after it burst into existence? Thank you. I think that the easiest answer to this question is probably the most accurate. That is, if ISIS is still around, it is basically because nobody really is fighting ISIS. Nobody I know of. Uh, well, who's fighting ISIS? The Syrian army is not fighting ISIS so much. There are a few confrontations, but quite limited. The Iraqi army is quite unable to fight ISIS after what happened to that army in Mosul. The popular mobilization in Iraq 
is basically a sectarian force. It is fighting ISIS, but it is producing even more recruits to ISIS on sectarian lines. So you don't know if um, winning back the Crete from ISIS it didn't help uh, after what happened in Tikrit in seeing Ramadi falling to, to ISIS. Who else? The Turks. The Turks, when they started using in Chirlik, the out of the first 1,000 sorties by the, Iraq, the Turkish Air Force, only, I think, five or six sorties were targeting ISIS. The rest was targeting PKK in Iraq. The coalition, well, most, a number of coalition air forces are now busy in Yemen. And as far as the others are concerned, nobody thought that bombing from the air could finish such an organization. The Russians. Out of 62 sorties until this morning, I think three were targeting ISIS and the rest was targeting other opposition forces in, in Syria. So I couldn't make a long list, but the evidence is there. The easiest answer is the most accurate. Nobody is really fighting ISIS. But everybody is taking pretext on the existence of ISIS to fight his own adversary, whatever this adversary is. The Kurds, the regime, the opposition, you name it. But ISIS has not been targeted as the serious uh, enemy for anybody to defeat. Therefore, it is still there. But there are other reasons. One other reason is some of those players, governments or forces, are also dealing with ISIS, buying oil, buying cereals, letting people join ISIS, sometimes doing a lot of business with ISIS, so there is also some people who are dealing with ISIS. So, but there is another reason as well. And the other reason is the fact <clears throat> that ISIS has produced for six to seven million people in both Syria and Iraq some kind of an order. Not the kind of order you would like to live under, certainly not me but still some kind of order. What is the alternative to that order? Well, the alternative is not great. It's not like uh, inferno in ISIS land and paradise elsewhere. The rest of the country is, is not very, very, very peaceful and prosperous these days. That is why the motivation among the six, seven million now living under ISIS control is not mm -hmm. so strong to challenge ISIS control. But there is more to that. And what is more to that is an extremely smart uh, playing by ISIL leadership of the tribal card in both Iraq and Syria, and now in Libya as well. If you want me to simplify, I would say that basically all tribes in eastern Syria, in western Iraq, and now in Libya, all tribes who have been supportive of the old regime are now supporting ISIS against the recently established regime. And those who are complicit of sort of some kind of cooperation with the recent regime are punished by ISIS. The good example is the Shuaitat in, in eastern Syria, like 1,000 of them have been killed by ISIS, or the Bunimr in the Anbar province of Iraq. Again, a few hundreds of them have been killed by ISIS. While tribes who have been supporting Saddam Hussein or the Ba'ath regime before 2003 are closer to ISIS. The same of Libyan tribes who have been supporting Gaddafi. And I think that ISIS has been playing this tribal card very, very intelligently. And of course, there is ideology. And this ideology is attracting a lot of people in the name of the caliphate and Islam, all the things you know of. So there is a combination of reasons. But still, I would say, if ISIS is still around, it is mainly because nobody is really fighting against ISIS. Okay, well, um, in the last, well, I guess last month, we had a, um, 
emergence of, of another force that's going to try to fight it. Um, we had the, the, Russian, the Russians injecting themselves into the theater. Um, I guess I'll turn to you, Fedor, for that one. It, it, obviously, it's, it's created a lot of speculation about what the Russians are looking to accomplish in Syria, but based on what Kassan is saying, <coughs> nobody's been fighting it for sure. But there's these other kind of very durable pillars that keep that organization sort of in place. So first of all, what's the Russian intention in Syria? And can it achieve those objectives? Um, and and how is it going to do that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm the second time here at Oil and Money. Uh, last year, we discussed one conflict with Russia, centrally situated this year, another conflict. So I feel uh, really my country is uh, becoming more and more important. I'm not sure I'm very happy about that, but, but still. You come next year. Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> so uh, the move in Syria was pretty surprising to many people in Russia because uh, the uh, support to Bashar Assad was not, is not something new at all. But uh, the general line was, of course, all the time that uh, we should not repeat mistakes by other countries and by Soviet Union in to get involved in the Middle Eastern conflicts directly. Why it changed? Uh, I think partly because of uh, two reasons. One reason, uh, Russian strategists and military people concluded that the uh, resilience of Assad regime is, uh, is decreasing. And there is a growing chance that the uh, country will be totally destroyed and uh, Assad will disappear. So, Will it be ISIS uh, in Damascus or somebody else? But this long-term relationship will be terminated. And that, that uh, brought uh, Russian uh, decision makers to the idea that it should be, more should be done to protect uh, the current uh, constellation. Uh, second reason, and I think it uh, changed, the mood changed approximately last spring. Uh, the rhetorics of security people, for example, in Russia changed. The understanding that ISIS is an extremely big threat to Russia, if not now immediately, then in, 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 in the future. The amount of Russian citizens fighting uh, in ISIS is very big. It's hundreds, if not thousands of people from Caucasus, from Volga region, from Central Asia with Russian passports. And uh, those are not just simple uh, those who decided for romantic reasons to come there. Uh, those people have uh, very good training. And uh, sooner or later, they will be back. And uh, in this regard, the motivation that it's uh, more, it's smarter to try to fight them outside Russia than to deal with them inside Russia, that's another motivation. And of course, the third motivation, which is uh, more uh, more politically cynical, uh, but I think it's quite stupid to hide it. Uh, the Ukrainian conflict has been, so to say, exhausted. So the, it's quite clear that uh, Russia cannot gain more out of this conflict. Uh, it's very long lasting, uh, not uh, encouraging process of um, routinization of Ukrainian uh, problems. And uh, uh, Russian leadership understood after a while that the more Russia is engaged in Ukraine, the less important uh, on the global stage. Because the Ukrainian crisis, which started as something very big and which was presented in Russian media and in Russian uh, society as a decisive move uh, by Russia to another status in the international affairs. Uh, at the end, it became uh, the circumstance which made Russia more and more marginal compared to what, what happened uh, at the global scale. So Ukrainian conflict is, in fact, peripheral. So in this regard, Syria is a way to re, to come back to uh, the international arena, to the real arena and to try at least to enhance the framework of dialogue with the West. Okay. Great. I, I want to get to Ukraine a bit later, so let's probably pick that up in a second. But I want to turn to Alistair right now. And 
ask um, the question we were talking about beforehand. Uh, you know, the, the Russian, uh, Russians, of course, bring a military hardware to Syria. Uh, they uh, have a different approach than perhaps the coalition has had. But of course, the, the trouble with aligning yourself with the you know, Assad regime and on the side of Iran is that you, you know, run the risk of turning the sort of so-called Sunni world against uh, you, and you suddenly become a pariah. So you, know, you can sit in Moscow and have a lot of uh, things to say and support sort of by, um, in spirit. But when you're on the ground, you suddenly become a target. So I mean, is that a risk for Russia? Or, or how do you see that playing out, Alistair? Well, I can quite understand how people may think this is a, a definite risk for, <clears throat> for Russia, because after all, we can recall that at the time that America was contemplating joining in the war on ISIS in Iraq, some very prominent uh, Gulf ambassadors were saying very clearly to Washington, if you bomb ISIS, you are bombing the Sunni world, and you should not do that. And I think that has become sort of part of an accepted narrative in Washington and London and Paris. Because that ha that's what happened in when the Americans were bombing, you know, but for that's example, Fallujah. what and, people yeah. have said. But I think what makes it different and what actually the Russians understand very well is that actually there's a, a great difference between traditional Islam uh, and this takfiri blow-in, which after all had no place in this part of the world, in the Levant. A few pockets emerged in the full 840s, but this is something which has come from a part of Saudi Arabia and is very much different uh, from it. I think there are other two reasons to it, which is important why it's not quite as black and white and polarized as you suggested in that question. And that is because there is a strong sense of the idea of citizenship of a secular state, uh, which is multi-ethnic and multi-sectarian. And that was a Syrian vision for a long time. And also because there are some great nations of the Middle East. There is Syria, there is Mesopotamia, there is Egypt, and there's Persia. All of these have a vision and a sense of their own past, which is not the same uh, as the sectarian. Why does Russia see this more clearly, perhaps, in the West? I think partly because um, orthodox, orthodox Christianity in Russia has always been closer to, to traditional Islam uh, than even, if you like, uh, Western Christianity, Vatican Christianity, if, if you like. Socially and culturally, they are quite close. And in fact, if anything, they have seen themselves as closer to traditional Islam, Levantine Islam, if you like, than they have towards the Vatican. After all, the Pope declared the 10th Crusade against Russian Orthodoxy. So there's a, a sense in Russia that they are seeing that they're acting on behalf, if you like, of traditional Islam. Not that they are against Islam, per se, but they're acting on behalf of traditional Islam to tip the region and let's be clear, we're not talking just about Syria, we're talking about involvement of Iran, we're talking about the involvement of Iraq, to tip the region against this cultural invasion of Salafism that has come from the Nejd and parts of Saudi Arabia and has, first of all, swept the eastern lands of Islam and now is sweeping into the northern lands of, of Islam. Why? Because I think, as Fyodor said very clearly, why? Because... Uh, for President Putin and others, they can see everywhere you look in the Middle East, states are disintegrating. Iraq is fractured. Syria is fractured. Lebanon is not a state. North Africa is in trouble. Egypt is on the brink. Yemen is in a state of chaos. And if any of this disappears, they can see that Wahhabism, this alien form, untraditional form of Islam, will prevail. And this is a huge political risk, a political risk, I might add, not just to Mother Russia, to the Caucasus, the Turkmen uh, mercenaries that have come down going back home, but to Europe itself. I mean, look at the refugee crisis that is tearing Europe apart at the moment. It's not just Syrians. This is a, a sentiment that runs across the whole Middle East. People see no light at the end of the tunnel. So it's not just the desperate on the beaches, but the middle classes, 
People are trying to put at least one family member into Europe if they can as a, as a protection uh, against uh, the future. So I think that Putin is very much strategically trying to defeat Wahhabism. Let's call it by its name, Wahhabism, and Wahhabism in all its manifestations, including al-Nusra. What are they doing at the moment? Uh, we heard from Ghassan that they're you know, not necessarily attacking particular ISIS process. It seems to me very clear what the Russians are doing at this time. First of all, they are clearing the area around their base of any opposition forces. This is normal military tactics. It's not something that's political. You clear the area so that you're not going to be taken by surprise. Aircraft are the most vulnerable when they take off and land, clear. The next thing that they are doing is that they are simply clearing all the pockets of opposition on the M4 highway connecting to Aleppo and the M5 going side. They're not choosing who are the opposition pockets along those highways. They're opening roads. They're opening logistic supply routes. And they're denying supply routes to the opposition during this period. It's essentially, this is military thinking, because what comes next, and everyone is focused simply on the air attacks, but what comes next is the ground operation. And that's clearly under preparation, and that's clearly going to unfold when they've weakened certain targets in ISIS and the other groups. They've cleared their logistic groups, blocked the logistic groups of the opposition. Then we'll see the ground operation. That's the difference between what's been happening so far in, in other theaters, and we'll see how it plays out. If it plays out successfully, a big if, it will tip the whole region in a different direction. This is a really big, if you like, strategic play by Russia, by Iran, and Iraq, because if it winds back the, the Wahhabi influence uh, sufficiently, it will change the whole political, geopolitical balance in, in, in the region too. That's what I believe uh, President Putin is about, to give a strategic defeat to uh, uh, ISIS, to Wahhabism, at the very pivot of the region, which happens to be Syria. But it's intended for its ramifications to extend right across the Middle East. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, th I think there, the skeptics will point out on that topic that we've seen this play before, because the Turks sort of said they were going to fight ISIS, and they started bombing the PKK. So it's, you know, but I, I guess we'll have to wait and see how it all plays out, because you know, it, you know, people will say, well, he, he, they're just targeting Assad's uh, enemies and the whole thing. So yeah, I, think, I think, you know, let's be clear. The Turks were not at any time at war with ISIS or al-Nusra. They were working with both of these groups. I mean, this is the elephant in the room, is that, you know, the Turks were supporting them, were facilitating them. You, I mean, to suggest that they were at war with them, I don't think, it, you know, is, is, is possible to sustain yeah. very clearly. Their interests were in supporting those groups, and still are, possibly. OK. Let's, uh, let's bring Bijan into the conversation. There was a, um, we had the Revolutionary Guard um, high-profile visit to Moscow recently um, that was reported, I think, earlier this week. And uh, I, I guess the question is similar to the question of Fedor, is what, what's Iran's plan in Syria? You know, what, what are their objectives, and how are they going to achieve them? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> uh, before I answer your question, I think it's important to say, I mean, it's, it's interesting what Alistair says about Putin's strategic vision. My, my description of our region currently is that there is a, an absolute strategic confusion across the region. Everyone is trying to uh, develop tactical reactions to the, the tactical actions of other uh, other players, and I don't believe that there is a, a clear long-term vision. And, and to all the things that uh, that the different uh, speakers listed as as the challenges in our region, you can add U.S. policy in the region, U.S. withdrawal from the region, oil price impact, all of these different factors that are creating this strategic confusion. And a strategic confusion in a region that is uh, dominated by a clear win-lose mentality. So everyone, as, as Ghassan clearly said, everyone is try using the pretext in the region to, uh, to try to empower itself, empower its own position in a region that is going through this 
strategic confusion. Now, what's Iran's uh, play? Iran, uh, first of all, as we all know, Iran has gone through a, a change of government uh, after the 2013 elections, and you can you can sort of identify different patterns in, in, in the Iranian strategy before Rouhani was elected or before Rouhani came to power and after Rouhani came to power. But there are a number of uh, sort of factors that are the same which bring Syria into the fold. First of all, the Syria for Iran historically now over the past few decades has played a very key strategic role. Syria was a sort of a, a part of the Iranian deterrent policy towards Israel. And it's important to understand that the same way Lebanon has, has played that role, supporting the Hezbollah, supporting the Assad regime, was part of, part of the regional strategy. Uh, today, uh, uh, the, the, the first priority, and this is now from the new government, the first priority is to fight terrorism and to fight Wahhabism. I agree. This, this notion of Wahhabism dominating the Islamic discourse uh, in, in our region is definitely a threat to Iran as well. And, and when you talk to the Iranian regime today, they will say, uh, we agree that there needs to be political reform in Syria. We agree that there needs to be you know, a, a, a broader political base. But that's not the priority. The priority is to push back the terrorists. And once the terrorists are pushed back, uh, there will be time to, for a discourse uh, on, on political reforms. Uh, and uh, this is how Iran uh, is positioning itself. Not necessarily, I, I personally don't believe what's being reported that Qasem Soleimani, the commander of the Revolutionary Guards, went to Moscow and sort of laid out the plans on how to defeat the, the Syrian opposition. I don't think there is such a strong strategic cooperation. But the <coughs> fact is that the policies of the past few years, especially the sanctions policy towards Iran, did create an axis between Moscow, Tehran, Baghdad, and Damascus. And this axis is at work right now in pushing back Wahhabism and, 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 and positioning uh, uh, it, its, its, its interests in the region. And, and Tehran understands itself as part of that, that axis, but not necessarily as a strategic partner to Russia with its uh, current strategy. So uh, I, I, I want to underline there is strategic confusion. I don't think any of the key players has a clear vision where this region will be five years from now. And, and they are just basically moving along, reacting and acting depending on what the other players are doing. And, and how far do you think Iran will go to actually defeat the Islamic State and ISIS? I mean, th this is what Ghassan brought up. Everyone agrees they don't like it, but nobody's really in a position to go and knock it out of its position. That's true. Uh, Iran has, has declared a clear sort of red line. Iran has said if ISIS gets close to the Shiite sites in Iraq, which is Najaf and Karbala and, and, and basically the southern part, or close to, up to 60 kilometers away from the Iranian border, then Iran would actually interfere militarily. Uh, so far, Iran's role has been to support the, the different Iraqi uh, uh, forces who have actually fought ISIS. I, I, in fact, I was at a presentation by, by a representative by, uh, from the Kurdish regional government, and it was very interesting. He was saying uh, when ISIS was approaching uh, the Iraqi Kurdistan, uh, the, the view in, in, in Erbil was, well, if they come too close, the Turks will come to our help. If the door, Turks don't come to our help, the Americans will come to our help. And then who came were the Iranians, actually. So the Iranians actually supported the Kurd, Kurd, Kurds in their fight against ISIS, supported uh, the Iraqi government through advisory and, and strategic cooperation. But a military intervention from Iran would only emerge if there is a clear threat to the Shiite sites, because they are important to Iran, or uh, if they come, this is the official line, up to 60 kilometers of the Iranian border. There has been some strategic, uh, sort of strategic advisory in Syria as well, but I, uh, as far as I know, no, no direct military intervention. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Alistair. Um, I, <clears throat> I think that uh, it's quite true that um, the region does appear to be very confused and in a state of confusion. And indeed, it is a, a region that is disintegrating. Uh, but I do think that we have seen very clearly um, that Iran and Iraq and Russia 
actually have preparing, been preparing, um, if you like, for the day after the P5 plus one negotiations came to a conclusion, uh, the next steps. And I do think that there is a strategic plan to roll back Wahhabism from at least that part. I think what delayed it was, first of all, uh, the, the need to wait for the outcome of the P5 uh, negotiations because uh, that was important that they should be concluded not with in the middle of a conflict in Syria and other um, ex extraneous events, um, uh, but also because Iran did try and reach out to Saudi Arabia during this time through people like Rafsanjani and others to try and see if there was the possibility of a, a negotiation a, a settlement of the region, of this confused region, a political settlement. But it's been quite clear that all those issues, all those initiatives have been rebuffed. And so what we have come to is the final decision of a number of states is that there has to be a political settlement in the region. If it cannot be done by negotiation, which it seems it can't be done by free negotiations, then it's going to come about by force of arms. In short, we see very clearly a shift that's taken place with John Kerry and others that said, you know, we are going to have our objective shared with um, Mr. Lavrov is that we will have a united, secular, and democratic Syria. First time the Americans have called for a, for a secular Syria, which excludes actually most of the protégés of, of, of the Gulf states. So I think we are moving towards it, and yes, you know, these groups will now face a choice. Either you join in a political settlement or the Russians will knock a few heads and say you're going to be eliminated from the process. It may be a little bit rough, but at the state that the region is in, you know, the prospects of sitting around with no pressures in Geneva with the Saudi, and Saudi Arabia on one side, Qatar and Iran, America and all of the European states, I don't think are likely to produce a settlement, and the alternative is that the region literally comes apart, not just Syria, right through to North Africa. Yeah. Okay, well, um, quickly, I, I wanna just take a bit of a poll. I mean, I'll start with you, Ghassan. Do you think in a year we still have Islamic State sitting there on the borders between Syria and Iraq? I, I, I don't share in this sort of uh, general uh, skepticism about the future of nation states, which I read uh, here and there. I think nation states are, uh, are real. They are constructs, of course. They are human constructs, and like any human construct, they can flourish or decay uh, one day. But I don't see like uh, this is uh, going immediately into uh, the dustbin of history. Uh, all these construct of post uh, World War I uh, constructs disappearing all of a sudden. However, I have to recognize that at least two forces need to be uh, kept in mind in sort of devising the future of nation states. First, the non state actors. You have around a dozen of them now in the Middle East who are better armed than uh, regular armies, better trained very often, sometimes with a cause, uh, sometimes with some kind of a mercenary touch to them. Uh, you have them in Libya, you have them in Syria, you have them in Lebanon, you have them in Iraq, you have them in Yemen, you have them everywhere, of different political persuasion, by the way, but they are there and uh, uh, these non-state actors will take some time to be defeated or marginalized in the game. They weren't there necessarily 10 or 20 years ago, and now you need to take them into consideration if you are in charge of a state, of a nation state. And the second factor is transnational force, and that is forces that are revisiting their ideology in order to make it a general one, a trans-border one. ISIS is one example of them, but not the only one. Plus, you have what I call the defeated armies uh, remnants. And these play a very important role now. You have a few thousand uh, Chechen defeated in Grozny by the army, by the Russian army, who have found a new terrain 
for their expertise uh, in Syria and Iraq. You have a few hundred uh, or thousand Turkmen as well uh, now in this. Uh, and you certainly have remnants of the Saddam's army uh, certainly playing a role <clears throat> in the hardcore of, of ISIS. So these groups are all challenges to the nation state. But I would not jump to the conclusion and say, because these groups are around us, it means the end of the nation state. What do you think? In a year, do we have Islamic State or not? So I agree that uh, it's too early to bury uh, nation states. The question is which nation states we will see in years to come. It might be different nation states. For example, if the Kurdish nation state officially, the Euro <coughs> will emerge, I will not be surprised at all. If Syria will be de facto or even the Euro uh, divided into different nation or sectarian states, who knows? Uh, as for uh, Islamic State, I agree that this particular force, this particular structure, organization, however you call it, might be defeated in case what uh, uh, Ghassan was saying that uh, uh, if, if somebody will start to uh, fight them seriously. But defeat of Islamic State would not mean defeat of this kind of ideology, which will reemerge in a different form in the area. And that's absolutely uh, sure that for decades to come, we will cope with that. And what makes me most con uh, concerned these days is that for the first time since very, very long period, since maybe 60s or early 70s, Russian and American air forces operate in the same area, very close to each other, without the idea to fight each other. But who knows what can happen in this situation, especially since the coordination uh, doesn't look uh, very, very, very stable. And I'm afraid that we are, contrary to what we learned after the Cold War, that military force is subordinate to political uh, ideas like democracy and so on. Now we have a situation that we need to rely on military people much more than on politicians because military people seem to be much more responsible. They understand what risks they can generate by, uh, uh, by acting reckless, while politicians make statements which are absolutely, absolutely senseless and dangerous. When Zbigniew Brzezinski writes that uh, U.S. Obama should retaliate if Russia continues to target U.S. assets in Syria. He means so-called moderate opposition. I think it's, it's just a provocation. Or Hillary Clinton says about non -fly, imposing non-fly zone in Syria. I'm afraid she simply does not understand what does it mean. It means war with Russia. Quickly, Bijan and Alistair, but what do you think? In a year we have Islamic State or not? I, I agree with Fyodor that uh, the Islamic State is one expression of a phenomenon called jihadism or whatever you want to call it, extremism. Uh, and extremism is not going to go away from this region unless there is a clear political process addressing a number of the grievances, not just the situations in, in Iraq or Syria, there is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there are a number of other conflicts. Uh, I think uh, extremism uh, translating into terrorism and translating into organizations like Al-Qaeda or ISIS will continue. What they will be called is, is irrelevant. They, the thinking is there and it's, it's true. It's a, it's a continuation of the Wahhabist, Wahhabist ideology. Yeah, Alistair? <coughs> I quite agree with what has been said, that uh, uh, we're not going to see the thinking that we've described, takfiri thinking, if you like, jihadist thinking of that form, um, disappear. It's a deep current that has been existent, extant within Islam uh, from the beginning. It's never been a majority orientation, it's been a minority orientation, but it has always emerged at times of crisis. The Mongol invasion, after the collapse at Vienna and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire uh, with Muhammad Abdul Wahab, um, and it will not disappear from it. But what we are talking about is also an artificial construct. Wahhabism 
has never had deep roots outside of the Nejd part of uh, Saudi Arabia until it was flooded with petrodollars. Uh, and uh, by a determination by the Gulf states to make this the one voice, the one religion, the one leadership uh, of the Islamic world and to, to reduce the heterogeneity down to a single Islam. Uh, and this is not a, it's just not going to be acceptable to the majority of, uh, of Islam, particularly those who've never had this tradition in it. And so money is critical. Uh, and if that money disappears, and if there is, I, I recall nearly 30 years ago in Afghanistan when I saw um, the Russians come into Afghanistan, the Soviet Union at that time, um, uh, in somewhere around 86, and uh, they came in very effectively with ambushes and advanced, uh, this was before Stinger and all of these things came in. Uh, by the end of the year, we had all of this jihadists sitting in Pashar and Quetta drinking tea and saying they couldn't go back into to the region. That's why they got Stinger. And I think this is the other issue. So what's, what are people going to do against Russia? You know, Saudi Arabia says, well, we'll react, and the Gulf states says we'll react. Well, they've already given them anti-tank weapons and advanced weapons of that sort. The only thing that's missing is advanced surface-to-air missiles. But recall what happened in Afghanistan. We gave the Mujahideen uh, advanced surface-to-air missiles, relatively, not completely. They weren't very effective. But the CIA then had to spend the next five years buying them back at $100,000 apiece because they posed a threat to Western civil aviation. So I think it's very limited how much they can really push back I I against uh, the Russian intervention. Well, I want to go to questions in, in a minute. I just want Fedor to weigh in on one of the points he made on Ukraine, since that was sort of the other binary thing that we were talking about. You said the, the conflict in Ukraine is exhausted in Russia. Does that mean we're winding it up, or are we sort of putting it on the shelf for a later date? Uh, what, what means putting on the shelf in this situation? It's very difficult to identify. I think that the uh, phase when sides, both sides, try to achieve new uh, objectives uh, is over. Uh, on the Russian side, uh, to be frank, there is one ambition to uh, gradually uh, get disengaged from this, Ukra this Eastern Ukrainian situation. Uh, of course, Russia cannot afford to do it abruptly, and uh, that's a question about uh, very long-lasting, uh, difficult, and pretty senseless negotiations about details how it will happen. But in fact, I don't see any reason to believe that on the Russian side there is any uh, willingness to escalate again. Uh, on the contrary, I'm afraid at this stage the Ukrainian position might be more dangerous because just in this new situation with Syria, with the Middle East, Ukrainians understand very well that the international at attention is sliding away. And the only asset, real asset they have, political asset, is the image of uh, uh, ever uh, suffering um, uh, victim of Russian aggression. And unfortunately, I'm afraid there are forces in Kiev uh, who would be, which would be interested to restore re re this image. And we see uh, pretty provocative moves by Ukrainian government, recent move uh, to ban all uh, flights between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine was very strange because they did not do it during the war. They did it now when it's calm. So, but at the end, I think everybody is interested to freeze it down and to try to step by step to, to, to get to, to a situation which will be no, maybe on the shelf or at least not play a big role in, in, in the current political situation. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll ask Bijan one question, then we'll go to the audience, if, uh, so get your questions ready. So, so quickly, we had talked briefly about gas supplies from Iran, which post nuclear deal in July, um, about getting gas supplies from Iran, potentially Europe. And I know you've talked about this in the past. Uh, there are obvious problems to that. But do you see this as, as a realistic prospect in the strategy of the Iranian government? I don't see uh, pipeline gas exports to Europe as a, as a piece of the strategy from Iran. Uh, some say because they don't want to 
uh, compete with Russia. Others say because it's not economical. But I think the reality is uh, that um, there is a deep psychological impact of these sanctions of the past few years, and Iran will not put itself in a position where it sort of is dependent on, on a major, uh, major client like the EU. And when you look at uh, the Iranian strategy, there is a major focus on uh, what you can call uh, gas-based industries. Iran wants to basically, the, the gas potential emerging is huge. Uh, we heard that also yesterday uh, from Dr. Fesharaki, the, the, the gas production that's coming uh, will be substantial. All the projects that are in the pipeline by 2020 will produce a major surplus. But the, the strategy is to one, uh, export as much as possible gas or electricity to the region. So there is a, there is a focus on the immediate neighbors. Uh, and second, uh, to promote gas-based industries so that Iran can become more significant, a more significant player in steel, in aluminum, in cement, and, and so on. So this will be the strategy. There is also talk about LNG as a, as a means of export to Europe. Uh, but this is obviously fully dependent on, on whether new technology will flow into Iran after these, the market is opened, after sanctions are lifted. Uh, floating LNG has become a topic, uh, but pipeline gas exports to, to the EU, uh, I don't see for the time being. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think at that point we'll turn to the audience. Um, Herman, since you're in front, you can, you can start. We have a microphone here. In the front there. Oh, Herman, please introduce yourself. Yeah, Before Herman Franz and EIG. Uh, for 50 years, the Americans have been the dominant foreign power in the region. They're still active in Yemen, helping the Saudis, the alliance there. Uh, but in this whole conversation, America has hardly come up. So I would be interested in reactions of the panel on how they see the after the, uh, the resolution now of the, the nuclear issue in Iran, how do they see U.S. strategy in the region unfolding? Uh, it still has the fifth fleet there. It's still active, as I said, with the GCC. How do you see this unfolding? Because it hardly came up in the conversation. Well, we need an American official here. I mean, <laughs> maybe next year we'll get one. Anyone want to field that one? Alistair, go for it. <coughs> Uh, yes, I, I, I think it's very important in the role uh, that actually Russia and others in Iran see for America uh, is important in this. What I mean by that is that whilst we have seen very strong rhetoric and efforts by some in Europe and in America to s throw a wrench in Putin's wheel in Syria, um, we have seen very big changes in the narrative coming from Mr. Kerry uh, before and after his conversations with Lavrov. Uh, when he was in London, uh, Mr. Kerry talked about uh, not that Assad must go. He talked about a transition. How long would the transition last? Well, whatever. But ultimately, he said, quotes, you know, it's a matter for the Syrian people to decide. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, he talked about a united Syria that is secular. Uh, so I think we see very clearly that um, Mr. Obama is definitely under pressure from opponents um, about working in any way with um, President Putin or, or, or Russia. But they are quietly trying to move towards a position at which there can be some political settlement uh, 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 in, in, in the future. And I think really, you know, uh, this, is, this is the choice that Europe and, and America has. I mean, do you continue to throw a wrench in, in, in the Russian attempt to, 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 if you like, push back Wahhabism in, in the region? Um, or do you try and join in, as Lavrov and Putin were clearly inviting uh, America, to join in the process and to try at the right stage to get a, a political, political outcome. Clearly, from the Russian point of view, the first has to be the military effort, the ground operation, and then we will see uh, where the ground lies after whatever is done to the uh, Wahhabist elements in it. Okay, thanks. Fido, you want to jump in on that quick? Yeah. One short, yeah. short uh, remark. I think the U.S. will be in really deep trouble in case U.S. maneuvering to 
not to cooperate, but maybe to coordinate with Russia, will face a blunt rejection uh, by some of regional powers, like Saudi Arabia, for example. And if somebody will start to deliver anti-aircraft arms to ISIS or to opposition or whatever you call it, that might be a real problem. One question here, and then we'll go here next. First here. Thank you. I'm Jeff Blanning from Schroders. Um, can we talk about oil for a bit? Um, the, um, I guess when the Saudi policy came onto the scene a year ago, uh, which was about the time of this conference last year, um, there were various suggestions about the, the objectives. One was to, to kill U.S. shale, and one was to, um, to attack Russia and Iran, and uh, we had various other conspiracy, th conspiracy theories. Um, U.S. shale has been proved pretty resilient. Um, it was, you know, it was suggested that Saudis went to Russia um, earlier this year and said, you know, if you give up Assad, then we'll cut production, which obviously the R Russians have rejected that idea. Uh, Saudis obviously are under a bit of pressure at home now because their policy seems to have failed miserably. What, what do you? Different, different members of the panel think about how you ha what role oil is really playing in these strategic moves in the region. Okay, thanks. So geopolitics of oil and, and how it's impacting our, uh, our oil producers. Who wants to take that, Bijan? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think there is definitely a, a, a dimension uh, in, in all the decisions, especially um, the impact of of the shale revolution on the significance of, of our region and the significance of Saudi Arabia in, uh, in global markets. Uh, I don't think it's, it's the only factor and I don't think uh, that we should sort of overestimate uh, the role of the oil price on some of the decisions. Uh, because you see, I mean, first of all, I always say that when you look at the past two decades and take even today's dollars, we are still actually above average of the past two decades. So we, we sometimes just look at the, the recent past and, uh, and, and uh, try to co come to conclusions. Uh, but um, uh, to be fair to the Iranians, uh, last year when Saudi Arabia made that decision and sort of asked the OPEC members for six months to defeat the shale operations, Iran was the main country that was opposing that, that outlook and was saying it would not work. Uh, and as, because that happened, and because maybe a lot of the OPEC members hold Saudi Arabia responsible for that decision, I personally believe that Saudi Arabia has to somehow react in the next OPEC meeting and, and come up with some sort of a, a, a reaction, especially considering that Iran will increase production and exports as soon as the sanctions are lifted. So the dynamics inside, inside OPEC is interesting. It's obviously the worst time in terms of Iran-Saudi tensions. Uh, but what I can tell you is that because it was mentioned in many, many fora that this one of the reasons was to put pressure on Iran. Uh, it, while there was some financial squeeze on Iran, it definitely did not change Iran's strategy on, on, on any of the regional and international issues. Uh, I think uh, when you look, uh, there's been a big change from last year when you asked about it. Saudi Arabia is politically overextended now, it's fighting four wars various fronts. They're not going particularly well, any of them. One of them is going disastrously bad. And it's increasingly becoming financially overextended. Um, it's, the estimates are its revenue loss will be at least 22% of GDP, but it's likely also to be much worse. And we see Saudi Arabia, if you like, selling off some of its um, uh, uh, holdings in hedge funds in London and elsewhere in order to to, to, to raise cash. I'm not saying it's going bankrupt ultimately, but it's under a lot of stress. I think really the question of the oil politics is now really subsidiary uh, to the question of the survival. You have a young man who's 29 or whatever the age that's attributed to him now that has crossed every red line of the family. The family is deeply unhappy with the situation and we don't know what is going to happen. But I think the politics of the price of oil now have become very subsidiary to the desire for the family as a whole to extricate themselves from Yemen and from their financial situation by whatever means is most appropriate. Okay, thanks. Theodore, add to that? Well, uh, 
I don't think that uh, oil calculation plays any significant role in current moves on the Russian side. It's purely political and strategic. Uh, meanwhile, of course, the Russia is suffering very much uh, from oil prices, and it's much worse factor uh, than uh, even sanctions imposed by U.S. and, and Europe. Uh, and as for Saudi Arabia, you know, Saudi Arabia, at least when it comes to relationship with Russia, uh, demonstrates each time same uh, miscalculation. Uh, Saudi Arabia sees a relationship with uh, uh, maybe a sort of big power, maybe in trouble, but, it's, but still big power in a pretty simplistic way. Uh, they believe that it's all, always about how, money you, how, how much money you can offer. And the different Saudi representatives came to Russia recent, several times recently, trying to understand the price. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in this way. That simple. So Russia will not play. Uh, the, 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 there are a lot of very greedy people in Russia as well. But it's more complicated, unfortunately. <laughs> I think next year we need a Saudi official and an American official, <laughs> panel, just uh, for balance. Uh, w one question here, then we'll go here. Oh, hello. Yes, uh, Tom Pepper, Energy Intelligence. Um, just feeding out of what Herman had asked earlier, I'm just interested to ask the whole panel um, how uh, is perceived Russian decisiveness in Syria um, starting to affect U.S. relations with Gulf states and Turkey, not just on Syria policy, but the wider region? Okay, Dasan, you want to take that? Well, <clears throat> the one thing where I repeat myself from one year to the other is the fact that Russia and America are not the same in the Middle East. In the Middle East, Russia, besides being a superpower or not being a superpower, is a regional power, where America is not a regional power. I mean, there is a phenomenon of contiguity between the Middle East and Russia. I hope that Fyodor is okay with this. Uh, uh, of geographical uh, uh, contiguity, of historical familiarity, and of a certain role uh, to play with the minorities, with the ideas, with etc. that America never had. So let us not put in the same sort of epistemological uh, category the Russians and the Americans when it comes to the Middle East. That's for Russia. As far as America is concerned, what we have seen in the past six or seven years is a policy, you may like it or not like it, but at least it is consistent. It's a policy of avoidance. Uh, uh, Mr. Obama has avoided uh, Petraeus' open-ended war in Iraq and withdrew. He decided to withdraw from Afghanistan uh, by the end of next year. Uh, leaving just a few thousand soldiers there. He avoided <laughs> confrontation with Iran by reaching the agreement on the nuclear uh, thing. He avoided playing the first role in the Libyan story by not uh, sort of uh, uh, taking the leading role in, in, in the war or by not giving too much attention to what happened in Libya afterwards. Although some of his allies are very, very involved here and there in Libya, Yemen, and elsewhere, in general, the strategy is quite consistent. Now, you may think one of two things for the future, because in a year from now, in a year, three months from now, you won't have Obama and what I consider to be a very consistent strategy. You'll have someone else, Hillary or somebody from the Republican Party, God knows. Then you will ask yourself the following question. Is this avoidance strategy, which has its advantages and disadvantages, the clear advantages is that you are not losing so many American soldiers there, that you are not uh, giving uh, the image of the ugly American, etc., etc. The disadvantage is that other forces, the Russians, the Turks, the Iranians, etc., are trying to fill a vacuum. You have partly created. But this policy 
is going to be challenged by the presidential campaign. In fact, it is being challenged already by the presidential campaign. It's what, what Fyodor said about Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, declaration on the, on the no-fly zone in, in, in Syria is important because it's different what, from what Obama says, because Obama has said clearly that this idea of no-fly zone in Syria is, I quote, a half-backed idea that he didn't like much. So if she's supporting it, it means that the campaign is already on. Mm -hmm. What will happen in a year and three months is that you will get another administration. I am sure that with the pendulum and domestic politics in America, you will have another policy as well. And then will come the question, is this avoidance strategy of the past eight years, seven years, eight years next year, is an aberration in American foreign policy that is going to be, quote unquote, corrected by the next president, or it's just the pendulum in American policy, but the pendulum will not go exactly where it was before Obama's, uh, Obama's uh, election, but somewhere in the middle, not to the Bush, Bush uh, Jr. era, uh, but certainly not stay in the Obama avoidance strategy. I am of the second line. I believe that this is going to be the case rather than just uh, see what Obama has done with his own strategy as just an aberration, as some, uh, some people in the Middle East hope it to be and are counting the days uh, until the day where he leaves the, the, the White House. I don't think this is, uh, this is very rational. I think it's a pendulum that will not go back to where we were seven years ago, but somehow a bit uh, closer to what is the situation now. Okay, thanks, Gassan. We're out of time. Nordi, I'm sorry. Uh, Bijan wants to say two seconds, and then we have to wrap up. Uh, one of the determinants about the U.S. relationship with the region will be obviously U.S.-Iran relations, and some, some are suggesting maybe an extension of these nuclear agreements would be a better relationship between Iran and the U.S. I just wanted to say the current top leadership in Iran is very much opposed to this idea, and, and I don't see a, a much closer relationship. I see sort of mutual understanding on some of the common threats, but I don't see a close relationship. So that's important that Iran-U.S. relationship would not become a a major uh, phenomenon of this region. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I want to thank our four panelists for a very inter interesting discussion on a very difficult set of topics. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to Ghassan, who has uh, stepped down from his post yesterday, and he claims this is his last oil and money after doing this for several decades. But uh, he's been a good friend of the conference. It would be very sad if he doesn't come back, but um, also give him a special round of applause for all his efforts. Thank you very much.